Hello, welcome to The Rest is History and on our tour of uh, the world's 32 most successful footballing nations. Today, Dominic, we are arriving in Poland. We are. And tour is the right word, Tom, because we will be doing something of a tour in this um, episode. Because I thought we we should do something completely different, which we haven't done before. So, you know the the seven wonders of the ancient world? I do, Tom, can yeah. You, can you name all seven? Well, it's complicated because they vary. They do. So the commonly acknowledged ones are... The Statue of Zeus at Olympia. Yeah. The uh, Hang Gardens of Babylon. Yes. Uh, and sometimes the Walls of Babylon. Oh, I don't have them on my list. So sometimes they're included. Uh, the yeah. Mausoleum in Halicarnassus. The uh, Pharos in Alexandria. Oh, yes, yes, the lighthouse, exactly. The Great Pyramid, yeah, which is the only surviving one. Yeah. How many have I done so far? I can't you've remember. You've done six. I think you've got one to go. Oh, no, you've got two to go. Do you want me to put you out of your misery? The Colossus of Rhodes? Colossus of Rhodes, yes. And, and what was the Temple of Artemis. Oh, uh, yes, at Ephesus. At Ephesus, yeah. Yeah. So they were supposedly, that comes from somebody called Antipater of Sidon in the second century. We've got to do an episode on them. We, yeah, it'd be a brilliant episode, yeah. wouldn't it? It's a, it's a re- the whole backstory to it is so interesting, but far distant from Poland. It is far distant from Poland, but of course, ever since people have, you know, people have said, "What are the seven wonders of the modern world? What are the seven wonders of Britain?" All this sort of stuff. And in the year two thousand and seven, the Polish newspaper Rzeczpospolita, uh, named as you will know, Tom from Res Publica, yes, the Latin for Republic, right, exactly, and named after the official name of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, a subject that we've often talked about doing on the rest is history, and still haven't done. But we were. So the po- we, we haven't done. So the Polish newspaper Reszpoch Polita, which is, I guess, Poland's kind of newspaper of record. So it's a bit like Le Monde or the or the Daily Mail, exactly. <laughs> Don't um, make the Times, and, uh, not the Daily Mail. And, and uh, they had <laughs> they had a competition, and uh, they had hundreds of entries, and experts whittled them down, and the public voted. And I thought it would be fun to talk about the seven wonders of Poland, as voted for by the polls, and what they tell us about history. So. We shall just crack on. Start with number seven. Okay, Dominic, before we do this, I have to put my hands up and say I have never been to Poland. Ooh. But it is very high on my list of places to visit. So I'm suspecting that this will absolutely confirm me in that. that, It definitely will, because I think this... This this podcast is not sponsored by the Polish Tourist Board. But it absolutely <laughs> should be. And but I if am they're very... listening, if they're listening and they'd like to make a contribution. They should make a contribution. We, we wouldn't say no, would we? We wouldn't say no. So we'll start off in, I suppose, the, the city that most people naturally gravitate to in Poland, which is not Warsaw, the capital, but is the city of Krakow. So Krakow, beautiful city. Not unlike Prague um, in its in its appearance, like all great cities, it has a legend. So Krakow was established on in a place called Vavel Hill, and the story goes that it had a mythical ruler called Krakus, who who built um, the city um, above a cave that was occupied by a dragon called Smok Wawelski. Um, lots of knights tried to kill this dragon and failed, but Krakus, he was culling and he was also culinary minded. He poisoned a lamb and gave it to the dragon, and the dragon ate it and died. So that was great news for him and for the Poles generally. I think that's slightly cheating. Well, it worked. I mean, oh, it did work. He's laughing, but, but I mean, it's 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 an oddly unheroic way to kill a dragon. Well, I'm going to say, so it's like this getting time. rid of a rat or something. Krakus has a wonder of Poland named after him, and you do not. But well, yeah, but I don't think I have to. I don't think I have to have killed a dragon. To, to well, criticise someone for, for, for their lack of dragon, ki- dragon killing I think capability. you do. I think if you haven't no, that's walked ridiculous. the walk, I think if you haven't walked the walk, as, as, as dragon slayers say. Uh, Dominic, that's like saying, unless you've been a Premier football manager, yeah. you can't criticise them. Well, that's what Premier League football yeah, managers they do, do say. <laughs> well, anyway, listen, whatever. <laughs> that's what let's dragon get, slayers let's, say. Let's get back to Krakow. So it's around Krakow, in what's the area known as Wielkopolska, that the, the tribe of the Polans, so the, the Poles, um, set up this sort of predecessor of the Polish state in about the 10th century. Uh, it's in the 10th century that we have the first name, crack, the appearance of the name Krakow from a Sephardic, uh, Sephardi Jewish traveler. Uh, in the 10th, 11th, probably the 11th century, it becomes the seat of the Polish government. It's almost destroyed by the Mongols. But then it becomes a member of the Hanseatic League, 
um, Krakow. So it has guilds and it has libraries and town Tall, houses. thin houses. All exactly. Those, yeah. And the yeah. thing is, in the West for so many years, pe- people of our generation, we grew up having internalized the Iron Curtain and thinking of this kind of this this fixed division between Eastern and Western Europe. And the study of Poland and this story of the Seven Wonders of Poland completely turns all that on its head because it's impossible to make any sense unless you realize how much Poland was integrated in that world of, you know, the low countries, Scandinavia, Germany, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And you see that in this great, um, this fantastic uh, public space in the center of Krakow, which is the Wanda. That is the Wanda, is it? Which is the main square of Krakow. It's the largest medieval square in Europe. It's called the Rynek Gwówny. It was built after the Mongol invasion. So we're talking about sort of uh, 14th century. Uh, most of the buildings surrounding the, the square are, are newer by now. You know, they've been replaced by 17th and 18th century buildings. But there are two buildings in particular that are, that are worthy of note. So one is the, the tower of the town hall, a fantastic Gothic building. It's the only bit of the medieval town hall that's left. It's made of so many of the buildings are in Poland that made of brick. So it's kind of Gothic brick, which is unusual. You know, you, you see that in the low countries. You might see that in Denmark or somewhere, but you don't really see it. You know, you obviously don't see it in Spain or Italy or, yeah. or whatever. And, and one of the things about Krakow. Yeah. And I guess this, this great square is that it, it's, it's one of the few cultural centers in Poland that is not devastated in the Second World War. Is that right? Yes. We'll, we'll, well, we'll come to a couple of others, actually, later in this list. But you're right. For the survival of wonders, so notorious, yeah. you know, the sev- only one survivor of the seven wonders of the ancient world, they've all gone. But Poland suffered so grievously in the Second World War that the, the very existence of these is, is, a, is a wonder in itself. Is a wonder in itself. Agreed, completely agreed. Um, so there's a town hall tower, but even more impressive, actually, is, a, is the cloth hall. I love a cloth hall. Nothing, you love a cloth is hall. More, nothing is more Hanseatic League than a cloth hall. Exactly. Exactly the point. So it's a, so the cloth hall, for those of you who don't know. So, so Krakow was situated. It was a perfect place for trade because people could come from Kiev and Rus. They could come from Lithuania on the Baltic. They could come from Hungary and Germany. They could come from the north, sort of from the North Sea into the Baltic and oh, then down the rivers and so on. And they would sell their wares in the, in this market square. And the cloth hall was a huge part of that. And it's originally a medieval building, but then it was remodeled in Renaissance fashion. So nobody thinks of Poland when it comes to the Renaissance, at least nobody in Britain. Copernicus, I suppose. Well, we're going to, Copernicus may feature Tom. Oh, very good. exciting. Excellent. I know you like a bit of science. I do. Especially a bit of Renaissance science. So, um, the Cloth Hall is now the spectacular red and white Renaissance building. It's colonnaded. It's used as an art gallery. Um, and, f- and out from it and from the square, there's this kind of grid of Renaissance and kind of Baroque era streets. Um, so Tom, actually, you would love it. You should definitely go to Krakow. I've got to go. Yeah. Yeah. Now Krakow fell from, I mean, perhaps you could argue one reason it's so well preserved is it actually slightly fell from prominence at the end of the 16th century in 1596. Yeah. So kind of like Bruges or Ghent or. Exactly. So a new king, Sigismund Vasa, he was king of Poland. I mean, incredible. He was king of Poland, Lithuania, Sweden, and Finland. Very impressive for a man who most of our listeners, I'm guessing, will probably not have heard of. And he relocates the capital to Warsaw. Makes much more sense. Uh, because it's going to be, it's, it's more central within his vast kingdom, with his, his vast yeah. kingdom. Exactly. And um, the other interesting thing about Krakow, of course, is very Jewish. So before World War II, it had about 90 synagogues and maybe as much as a third of its population, um, was Jewish. And of course, yeah. the overwhelming majority of them, um, were destroyed by the Nazis in the Holocaust. That's, that's where Schindler recruited. Right. Schindler's list is set. From, exactly. Polanski was in the, the ghetto there, Roman Polanski. And do you know what? Polanski will also be returning. Roman okay. Polanski. All right. Sorry. I'm, will also I'm, be I'm jumping the gun. No, no. It's great that you're, uh, you're setting up all kinds of um, threads <laughs> that yes. we shall okay, follow through wonderful. the story. Yeah. So the Krakow main square is our first, our first wonder. Now you were talking about places that were perfectly preserved and not destroyed in the second world war. And that is true of number two on the list. So number two is a town called Zamosch. So have you ever heard of Zamosht, Tom? No, I haven't. So it's in the far east of Poland. So it's very close to the Ukrainian border. It is a unique example 
of a perfectly preserved, planned Renaissance town. So again, this this Renaissance, yeah, it's another and, brilliant yeah. example of how the the idea of a distinction between Western and Eastern Europe is is meaningless because it's it's an, it's basically an Italianate town in the east, in the far east of uh, Poland. So so what's it doing there? Well, now we have to sort of leap a bit further forward in time from the sort of medieval period. So. In the 16th century, Poland was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the biggest state in Europe, this absolutely sort of sprawling beast with colossal diversity, religious, cultural, ethnic diversity. One of the things that held it together was the political elite, so, who called themselves the Slashta, so they were the kind of nobility. And they had two very strange things about them by the standards of the 16th century. The first was they were devotees of something called Sarmatianism, so they believed they were descended from the Sarmatians, oh. the Iranian steppe masters of the Slavs. Yes. And were they? I guess they weren't. No. But, but, <laughs> but they dressed as Sarmatians. So they wore that. cosplay, orientalist clothing. They had, they sort of put on turbans. They wore jewel daggers, all this kind of thing. Well, fun. So if you'd gone to Poland and gone to meet the nobility in the area of the Renaissance, you'd, you'd think you were in Sarmatia. Yeah, or, or indeed you'd think you're in some sort of, you know, Indiana Jones or James Bond film of the worst orientalizing kind, right. with people with scimitars and stuff and colossal moustaches, but who were clearly just dressing up. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And the other thing they're obsessed with, not unlike you, Tom, is ancient Rome. So as well as doing all this, they also have their hair cut like ancient Rome. <laughs> Now that slightly, it's a bit of a, yeah, it's difficult to do that when you're carrying off a jeweled yes. scimitar, but they do it. Okay. So I can understand dressing like a Roman. I can understand dressing like a, you know, a barbarian of the steppes. Yeah. Why, do, to, why, to not, do both. why not do both? Why not do both? Well, I suppose. Yeah. Syncretic. I mean, if you're a Polish nobleman, you can, you have I the money. You, I suppose that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cause the Renaissance obviously explains why they're so interested in ancient Rome. Yeah. Cause that's the standard. I mean, people are aping Rome throughout European history, but the Sarmatians are, I, mean, I think it's their location. Recherche. It's their location, probably. You could argue at the end of the Great Eurasian Steppe. Yes, I suppose. would you not say? I mean, that there's yeah. some elements of that that they see themselves because, of course, their territory. If they're ruling the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, their territory covers modern day Belarus, yeah, you know, Western Ukraine, and so on. Much of Ukraine, in fact. So, you know, they're not that far away from steppe nomads, yeah. and yeah. they want to see themselves as the kind of as both. Yes, exactly. So, but because of the Roman bridge stuff, between two worlds, Dominic. Very nice. Poland, land of contrasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. And if the Polish tourist board want to get in touch, as I say, yeah, don't don't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> so they, um, so they will always. If, if you have, a, if you're an educated young man, you will travel to Italy. You'll go to Venice, or particularly to Padua. Padua is a hugely popular destination for young poles in the 16th century. So, is there one any in four, reason for that. I think it's that cl classic thing of a kind of critical mass. Yeah. Okay. That lots go and then more do go. So in the mid to late 16th century, an astonishing statistic, one in four students at the University of Padua is Polish. Wow. And they come back home and they build Italian Renaissance palaces and churches and country houses and things. But there's a guy called Jan Zamoyski and he goes one better. So he is your classic kind of senator's son from Poland, born in 1542. He's gone to the Sorbonne. He's gone to the University of Strasbourg. He's gone, of course, to Padua, where he gets a, a law doctorate in 1564. Um, he writes, Tom, I'm very much a man after your heart. He writes a brochure, a little brochure called De Senatu Romano, about, uh, about ancient Roman government and how it worked. He comes back home. He becomes a uh, chancellor of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. He gets all signs of senior offices. And he decides all these other people have built churches and stuff. I'm going to go much better than that. I'm going to build a whole city. I'm going to build the ideal platonic city. And that's Zamosht. So he wants to model it on the cities that he's seen in Italy. He gets a, an architect called Bernardo Mirando. Do you want to guess where he's from? Uh, would he be from Italy? Yeah, the town uh, Padua. Padua. He's from Padua, exactly. So this is the this is the Prince Charles of Polish <laughs> yes, history. It is. It's the kind of the Poundbury of. It is the Poundbury. 
So Bernardo Mirando builds this, designs this city, which is all geometric, everything perpendicular, the streets parallel. You've got a palace at one end. You've got the town hall at the center, a star-shaped fort surrounding it, um, arcaded kind of um, two-story tenement houses, so colonnades and things, all brightly colored. And and it's a tremendous, I mean, it's a great success. You know, for once in the rest is history, <laughs> nothing goes wrong. He builds this place. It's absolutely beautiful. Again, um, I mentioned this with Krakow. Zamosht becomes a very big Jewish center, so it becomes a great base for Hasidic Judaism. So the outbreak of World War II, just under half of its population, who are living in these this sort of Renaissance Italian-style yeah. <laughs> yeah. town, are Jews. They are all deported by the Germans under the most horrific circumstances. I mean, to read the stories of the deportation from Zamosh are horrible. Um, many of them were killed on the spot. The rest basically were all killed in Belzec or Auschwitz. So to give you a sense of the death toll, there were about almost 13,000 before the war. By the end of the war, there were seven. Um, Goodness. So, Goodness. Yeah. Uh, you know, awful. The Germans, when they got there, were not impressed with the place. They, oh, they did not, not, it turned out. I thought they would um, they, enjoy a bit of... They said it wasn't in a sufficiently German. Right. They didn't like a sort of Italian Renaissance building in eastern Poland. The SS took it over, and they wanted to call it, to rename it Himmlerstadt. And Himmler said no, because Hitler had not yet had a city named after him, and it would be... Presumptuous. Um, presumptuous. So they yep. decided they would rename it Flugstadt, which means plow town, which is not as good a name as Zemolst. No. And they wanted to blow up all the buildings and replace them with German buildings. But fortunately, and this is a theme we'll, again we'll come back to, the local German administrator thought this was bonkers. You know, he, he just thought that was crazy. So he played for time. He kept saying, well, what kind of German architecture would we replace it with? And rejecting all the designs to make sure that basically they hadn't blown it up by the time the Red Army arrived to liberate it. And that's why if you go to Zemosh today, in the east of Poland, it is still this perfectly preserved temple to the values of the Renaissance. And can I ask you, the Count Zamoyski who built yeah. it, is he the ancestor of Adam Zamoyski? The, I believe uh, he is. The yes. distinguished um, historian. historian. Exactly. I believe he is. I know that Adam Zamoyski is part of the great Zamoyski dynasty. Um, so even if he can't trace his direct, his He's a descent. Yeah, he has that, a link. You know, he, he's there's there's. De I think there's almost a, almost definitely a link. Yes. Okay, so that's a that's another place to visit. Yes, on my good. List. So Tom, uh, that was number seven, number six. Now number five. Um, the the big question with this one is whether or not you like canals. I love a canal. I've just gone. Oh, out from I know. Last month I was in Venice. I I went on a gondola. Okay, love, I love it's a, a very canal. different kind of canal. Um, you know, and I love Birmingham, <laughs> the Venice <laughs> okay. of the north. Well, this is a rural canal. Are you happy yeah. with rural canals? Yes. I'm, so this yeah. is the Elblong Canal. Um, it's spelt Elblag, but it's pronounced Elblong. So my uh, Polish contacts tell me. Um, and so we've leaped further forward in time here. So the Zamoyski kind of period when they were building Zamosk is kind of a real golden age for the Poles. Um, you know, Poland is big in self-confidence and so on. But from the mid 17th century onwards, the, Poland is in decline. It's invaded by Sweden. It's invaded by Russia. Warsaw is destroyed by the Swedes. This is the period that the Poles call the deluge. Yeah. And I think it's never good to have a period in your, no. your history called the deluge. Slightly what we've been living through. They, <laughs> well, um, they end up being partitioned, uh, by their neighbors. So Russia, Prussia and Austria. And, um, in the late 18th century, a bit is taken over by um, Prussia. Now, the area of Elblong had been founded by the Teutonic Knights, and it had been then taken over by Poland. And then at the end of the 18th century, it becomes Prussian, becomes basically East Prussia. If you are going to be partitioned by the Russians, the Prussians, and the Austrians, I guess, I mean, it seems like a weird thing to say, but you probably want to be in the Prussian bit. Because they'll build you industrial infrastructure. Exactly. The Prussians are the most kind of economically advanced. Um, and you can, you know, I mean, it's none of it's ideal. I think you least want to be in the Russian bit, frankly. Isn't that always the case? It is always the case. But the Prussians invest in economic development. 
So the Elblong Canal is the most famous example of this. It's built between 1825 and 1844. It's 50 miles long. Now, you know, we live in a country famous for its canals. It's industrial canals. So you might think, well, so what? Who cares? The amazing thing about it is that it connects land areas that are on completely different levels. And instead of you having to sort of, you know, you know the canal comes to an end or something, what they do is your boat goes onto a kind of carriage on a track and it uses all kind of wheels and stuff to basically pull you up this steep oh, slope. Oh, right. So a bit like um, those rides at theme parks. Right, you, exactly, like the rides yeah. at theme parks. And, the, and then yes. you go whooshing down and get splashed. Exactly. So it basically does that. So that's, a, that's, I mean, that's a lot less work than having to, to go up loads of locks, isn't it? Exactly. It's much, it's much, it's, it's much better than locks, actually. I think it would be much, I haven't been on it myself. Michael Palin has been on it. Has he? He went well, to it in his series, The New Europe, and he's got a big description in his book about how they're, they're sailing along perfectly normally. And then they suddenly, they find themselves going up at kind of 45 degrees. <laughs> Oh, I must go and do it. Yeah, and they see they they pass another boat that's going down at forty five degrees <laughs> next to them, which sounds absolutely amazing. So they go, you do lots of these sort of slipways in your journey. So this is a part of Poland that was Prussian, and then it was taken over. Uh, and is this is the this Poles. the only place in Europe where they have this? Is that why it's a wonder, or is this standard Prussian canal building? I'm, I'm not massively familiar with canal technology um right but i think uh i've never heard of anywhere having i've it. never heard of it no no it sounds great so tom you would like that as well i would it sounds yes do you know what do you know what um I, i'm quite minded to, to work out a, a whole a, a trip to poland that's entirely structured around these seven wonders and yeah. there's there's one place in poland i particularly want to visit and i will be interested to see if it's in the list and if it's not then i'll have eight wonders Ooh. I think at this point, yeah, uh, we should take a break, and when we okay. come back, we'll have the, the last four wonders, and we'll see if the wonder that I want to visit is numbered among them. Very good. Hello, welcome back to the rest is history, our Polish episode in our World Cup Odyssey, um, and we're looking at the seven wonders of Poland. We've had three, Dominic. Uh, yeah. And you're going to start, you're going to tell us now about the fourth. So, Tom, you will recall you were very sceptical. I thought, I thought cruelly sceptical about Krakus, who poisoned a dragon with a lamb. Yes. I, I, uh, I'm the not, founder of Krakus. I, I am sceptical of him. Now, you will recall the name of the dragon, Smok Wawelski. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Krakus had, you know, he lived in a cave under this hill that is now named after him, Wawel Hill uh, in Krakow. And the fourth wonder is the complex that's on the top of, of Vavil Hill. So we're back in Krakow, and there are two buildings on this on this hill that are worthy of note. So one of them, very much a building after your heart, is the cathedral. Ah, oh, good. So it's a Gothic cathedral. The Polish yeah. kings used to be uh, crowned here, and they would go on this procession through Krakow to get to the cathedral. And the route of the procession was known as the Royal Road. So you can still kind of walk the Royal Road or whatever. Often Polish kings were buried in the cathedrals. Lots of other famous people are buried there. You know, the titanic figures of Polish history. So General Sikorsky, who was the leader of the Polish government in exile in the Second World War in, in London, he's buried there. Uh, Joseph Pilsudski, who beat the Russians um, in the 1920s and is the sort of father of independent Poland. He's buried so there. So it's, it's, it's the Westminster Abbey of Poland. It is the Westminster Abbey. Yeah. The greatest Polish poet, Adam Mickiewicz, great romantic writer, uh, famous his poem Pan Tadeusz. He is buried there. Uh, but the most famous person, Tom, a Krakow boy, former Krakow student. Uh, now, he's not buried there, but he is associated with the building. Uh, a man called Karol Wojtyła. And you certainly will know who he is because he went on to become the Pope, yep. Pope John Paul II. And his return to Poland in 1979 was a key moment in the foundation of Solidarity, the trade union that yes. helped to bring down communism. Is Lech Walesa buried there? Uh, he's not dead. Lech Walesa's still alive? Yeah, he's, he's 79. Oh, bless him. Oh, well, I mean, he looked know. about 49 when he was leading Solidarity. Yeah, he did. 
But he, well, uh, he, looked, he looked like an ancient Gaul, didn't he? he had a, he looked like a yeah, well, brilliant he looked like a man moustache. who worked in a Polish shipyard. Yeah. So I mean, well, he did. Which well, he did. Uh, so he's not buried there, but but maybe he will be. I should think he will be. Um, so the other building on the hill is called Vavil Castle, and this has a slightly grimmer story. Um, so it's a real hodgepodge. It's not a particularly attractive building. It's a hodgepodge of Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque. It was always being looted by the Swedes and by the Prussians and so on. When Poland was partitioned, Krakow was Austrian, and the Austrians tr- treated it with sort of neglect. So it was it, it, it fell into disrepair. But after Poland became independent at the end of World War One, it became an, an official residence of the Polish president, although the Polish president spent most of his time in Warsaw. When he came to Krakow, he would stay there. Then the Germans invade. 1939 and its most infamous resident is the guy who hitler sends to run occupied poland known as the general government who is his personal lawyer hans frank a very very bad man and the the extraordinary thing about hans frank at wavel castle in krakow is that it's it, it, it slightly it challenges your kind of prejudices i suppose about the nazis because hans frank was not a brutal philistine he was an extremely civilized and educated man who played the piano who decorated the castle with looted artworks who summoned intellectuals and people to play chess with and all these kinds of things so he's got he's quite a troubling i mean he's a troubling figure anyway obviously but he's a he's a troubling figure because he is you know He's that that stereotype of a kind of yeah. extremely elegantly, you know, his wife. Yeah, he's, you know, she she styles herself as the queen of Poland. The thing is, um, Polish people are now are under his rule banned from visiting their own castle. They can only visit if they're cleaners. They're the only poles allowed inside. And you mentioned Roman Polanski in the first half of this episode. Polanski's mother was a cleaner. And she was right. allowed, therefore, to visit the castle when Hans Frank was there. Um, and at the end of the war, a bit like with Zamosht, when the Nazis are clearly losing, they wi- give instructions for the castle to be wired with dynamite and blown up. But for uh, reasons that uh, to this day I think are slightly unclear, they didn't detonate mm. it. So the castle was not, in fact, destroyed. And, and just a question about the, the Soviets when they arrive. Yeah, they they don't kind of see these as bourgeois. Well, emblems of emblems of Polish identity, as well as emblems of uh, you know feudal reaction. I suspect the Soviets do see that. But what's interesting is that under the Polish communist regime at the end of World War II, there's a huge effort that goes into conservation. So particularly in Warsaw, Warsaw is rebuilt yeah. under the communists in this kind of painstaking style, the center of, you know, the, you go to Warsaw, the sort of the old town square and stuff. I mean, all that is, as it were, in inverted commas, fake, rebuilt at the end of World War II. So no, I think the Polish, the Polish communist authorities have a... They're proud of the, their country's history. Yes. To some, well, well, with to a degree. I mean, it'd be interesting to, if we have Polish listeners who know more about this stuff than, frankly, than I do. Um, to explain the kind of the, the very ambiguous relationship they have with their own, yeah. with their own past. So that's number four anyway. We've got three to go, Tom. Okay. And the last, and the, and the three, the top three, I have to say, they, they are absolutely fantastic sounding places, none of which I have been to. So you've been to the other four, have you? Uh, if you believe I've been to the other four, that's a tribute to my podcasting because I haven't. <laughs> no, it was just the way you framed that. Yes, I know. Well, I find that <laughs> deliberately to try and suggest a, a degree of expertise. So you were an old Poland hand. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. I know my <laughs> <laughs> I know my linguistic ability. Well, you've been to Belarus. I have been to Belarus. And in fact, I've been to Warsaw, but I haven't been to... Okay. I've never been anywhere in Poland outside Warsaw. Okay, so number three, I know everybody likes a proper castle, and this is a proper castle. This is, in fact the largest castle in the world. Is it? It's, it's Malbork Castle. Wow. The great castle of the Teutonic Knights. The Nazis must have loved them. They do. Oh, well, I tell you, and not just the Nazis, as we will discover. So the Teutonic Knights, as you will probably know, Tom, were founded in Acre in 1191 by German merchants. 
And then they get involved in all these kind of Prussian crusades and Baltic crusades mm -hmm. a few decades later. So in the early, what are we, the early um, 13th century. When the Teutonic Knights had conquered what's called Old Prussia, so basically East Prussia, these days it's partly Poland, partly the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad. They wanted to cement their control of the area over the Baltic tribes. And, of course, they do what people do. In the Middle Ages, they build this massive castle. And it clearly took them. There's no records left of the castle's um, building, but we know that it must have taken them decades. Um, it's on the bank of the river Nogat, and it, they called it Marienburg after their patron saint, the Virgin Mary. Eventually, it becomes the administrative center of the Teutonic Knights kind of land of uh, East Prussia. Um, it gives them control of the amber trade on the river. So obviously, Baltic amber is incredibly lucrative. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it acquires this sort of romantic place in the German-speaking world's imagination as the castle of these sort of terrifyingly grim crusaders who have subdued the tribes of the sort of wild, swampy, forested um, northeast. But the Teutonic state is defeated, crucially, at the Battle of Grunwald, in 1410. So that's the, the Eisenstein, in the Eisenstein film, is it? Is that no, that's, a, that's, a, that's by Alexander Nevsky when they're attacking Russia. But they're then beaten by the Poles, by the Poles and Lithuanians. And that was the Battle of Lake Pipus, but this is yes. the Battle of Grunwald. Uh, so they're beaten there in 1410. And after that point, the Teutonic state is never really the same again. So ultimately, Ma Marienburg Castle is taken over by the, um, by the Poles. And it goes through a time when Poland is partitioned, when it's Prussian again, and then it basically becomes Polish at the end of World War II, and is Polish, obviously, to this day. And the remarkable thing about it, so I've, I've described it as a castle, but actually it doesn't really give a true sense, because, of course, the, the remarkable thing about it is that it is brick. It is all brick, not stone. So it's, it's kind of red brick. A red brick castle. It's one of the world's largest brick buildings of any kind. So it has churches, it has chapels, it has a colossal refectory, it has all this kind of stuff. And it looks, therefore, completely unlike a castle you'd find in, you know, North Wales or the Long Dock or yeah. the other great kind of castle. Do you know, I, I, I have seen it. Uh, not, I mean, not in person, but I know about it. Yeah. Are you, are you aficionado of medieval combat, which is a sport that was originally <laughs> developed by the Russians? And oh, then, you've told me about this before. And then they practiced it. It was too brutal. So then they, they reconfigured it and expelled the Russians. Anyway, they have, they have an annual championship. And How did they do it there? One of the annual championships was, was at Malbork. Well, you see, you should definitely um, visit it, Tom. You'd love it. Because do you know who also you'd be following in the footsteps of a great friend of the rest is history? Do you want to guess who it is? Uh, who would enjoy a Teutonic Knight's Castle in occupied you know, Poland. I don't know. It's Kaiser Wilhelm II. Oh, is it? Yeah. Is it? And do you know what he did? And he wore the right shoes to this, I guess. He Well, he he did because he dressed up as a Teutonic monk oh, for the occasion. That's definitely wearing the right costume. I would not recommend that you do what he did next, which is he gave a virulently, violently anti-Polish speech. No, I wouldn't do I that. I think that would be very high no. risk. But you could dine. I've, I've dug out for you the... Um, the menu for what the Kaiser ate when he went to uh, Marlborough Castle. Was it bison? He's kicked off with something called Kaiser soup. I don't know what that is, but mm. I think a soup. I was about to say you should definitely have something named after yourself. We should find, we should find that out, shouldn't we? Yeah. We, could, we could have a kind of rest of history restaurant. <laughs> we could. Well, <laughs> I was about to say, Tom, of the day, Kaiser soup. The Kaiser started with something named after himself, and you should do that. But then I looked at the rest <laughs> of the menu. This Hollandaise will not sauce. be an issue for you, because the very next dish was called turbot fish in Holland style. <laughs> Brilliant. So you're I laughing. love that. He had veal. He had ham. I want this menu. He had Strasburger pudding. I don't know what that is. He had goose. He had asparagus, strawberries and cream, cheese sticks, and dessert. And uh, what was he after dinner entertainment? Don't know. Well, was, that, was there any... Uh, any <laughs> was there a uh, any any tutu ballet wearing. dancing. From yeah, <laughs> German generals dressed as ballerinas who died unexpectedly. Sorry, this is a reference to our podcast about the world's worst parties, which will be lost on some listeners. Anyway, that's your holiday absolutely sorted, isn't it? I yes, mean, it is. you're laughing. It is. So we've got two to go. Okay. Um, 
Number two is another beautiful city with a scientific connection, Tom, just for you. Is this where Copernicus comes in? Yes, this is a town of Torunia. So this is uh, in central Poland. It's midway between Warsaw and Gdansk. I won't go give you a whole run through through its early history because that's kind of very similar to the others. Is there a dragon? Uh, there's no dragon, there, but there's an awful lot of cloth hall type behavior. <laughs> so guilds, <laughs> uh, Hanseatic leagues, Hanseatic league carrying artisans, on. you know, all this sort of stuff. Because yeah. uh, it's located on the River Vistula, so. Um, which always slightly sounds like a medical condition, I think. It does. It does, yeah. Ooh, nice. I've got a terrible so, uh, <laughs> so it's on a Ford in the Vistula, so it's perfect um, trading centre. It becomes a big Protestant centre. It's very multicultural. But there are three things that uh, mark it out. First of all, like some of these other places, it is not damaged in the Second World War. So and it's medieval that? architecture. Just luck. Uh, it had awful massacres, actually, in World War II, and it was a big centre for the Polish resistance. But through luck, it wasn't particularly damaged. Um, it has, I read, the best collection of Gothic brick buildings in Europe. So it has a so cathedral, if you like, it has churches. So if you like medieval brick buildings, Pol- like, this, Poland is clearly this, the place to go. Not only is Poland the place, but this has probably been the best podcast of your life. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Your, <laughs> the, your hour has come. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so there's guild halls, there's merchants houses. Now there's one house in particular that you would want to visit, Tom. It's on 17 Copernica Street. I definitely would. It's a sort of, again, brick building, mm-hmm. gothic brick, mm. sort of narrow, terraced, soaring. Mm-hmm. So the kind of building absolutely that you would see if you went to Bruges or Ghent or somewhere. Yeah. Um, now, in the 15th century, this be- belonged to a man called Mikowai, who came from a Silesian family. He was a copper trader. And he married a local councillor's daughter called Barbara. Barbara. And they had Barbara. Barbara. Yes, that doesn't sound Barbara. a Polish name. Is that a Polish name? Maybe. Clearly it is. It's kind of, um, wow. Well, actually, national identity is slightly muddy and ambiguous or in this period, as we okay. should go on to. Yeah, exactly. Is it German or Polish? Because um, their son, we call their son Nicholas Copernicus. Um, he was born in 1473, and he is a classic Polish Renaissance figure. He's a doctorate in law. He's a mathematician. He's a cathedral canon. He's obsessed, obviously, with astronomy, which is why we know about him. But w- what is he? Is he, as it in inverted commas, Polish? Well, he spoke Latin, Greek, Italian, and Polish, but probably his native language was German. But of course, the Poles claim him. I mean, he studied in Padua, of course. Where else? Uh, he spent time in Rome. He's most famous for his thing about revolutions of the heavenly spheres. And, and of course, Poland makes a huge deal about Copernicus, as you would. Um, and, and But the Germans you know, historically have always tried to claim Copernicus as German. So I looked at what Norman Davis, the great historian of Poland, said, and he said, taking everything into consideration, there is good reason to regard Copernicus both as a German and as a Pole. And yet, in the sense that modern nationalists understand it, he was, of course, neither. So mm-hmm. that's, that's the, a very uh, Norman Davies. It is. It is very framing it. It is. Um, having his cake and eating it, Tom. Or is he having his gingerbread and eating it? Because Torunia is also the world's great center of gingerbread making. That is top podcasting. (laughs) Thank you. Seamless. That was kind of like a ballerina, like a German general in a tutu. It was masterly. Doing a perfect tirouette. Absolutely masterly. So Torunia is perfectly placed for gingerbread. They've got everything they need. They've got all the wheat and all that stuff. They've got water. They've also got the spices because of its position on the trade routes so spices are coming through from the black sea and so on or they're coming to gdansk so the first mention of torunya gingerbread comes from 1380 the cistercians produced those of gingerbread under the prussians there was a factory that was exporting gingerbread so this is obviously in the when i say under the prussians we're talking about in the 19th century they were exporting gingerbread from this town to china Mm-hmm. Would you believe? I know I sound like Liz Trust talking about <laughs> port, port markets. markets. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I talk about gingerbread markets. And if you go there, Tom, you can buy gingerbread molded in the shape of Pope John Paul II. Wow. 
Uh, but surely in, in Copernicus as well, or maybe a model of the oh, undoubtedly Copernican the universe? Or... Undoubtedly. Wow. Undoubtedly. I've got to go. So I've got one wonder left, the top wonder. Now, you said you had a wonder of your own that you wanted to see, and I wonder if it, it, well, I wonder if it's going to be the same one. Which is the place you want to see? Well, I don't know how to pronounce it. What is it? Okay, it's a forest. It's not that. Okay, can I just listen? Okay, we'll come to... Tell me about your forest. I hope that I have my pronunciation right. It's the the Asia forest. The Asia forest. Um, <laughs> I, I, I freely admit... Bang goes that money from the Polish know, tourist board. But it's, uh, so it's, it's also in Belarus. So I thought that yes. that might be of interest to you. Forest. And it's, it's supposedly um, the only part of the, the primordial European forest that, that Caesar saw when he, when he went to the Rhine. Um, and it's all that there is That's left. That's absolutely right. And there's um, 800 of the uh, European bison left that, again, were part of the, the primordial cattle stock that roamed it. Uh, and there's a brilliant chapter about it in uh, one of Sharma's books. I think it's Landscape and Memory. Uh, and ever since I read that, I've wanted to go. So um that's not but that's not one of the wonders that's not it i guess because part of it is in belarus so it's in it's belarus competitive. that's where they proclaimed the end i think of the soviet union oh right yeah right on the on the uh on the belarusian side um no this is a salt mine a salt mine are you not familiar with a vialitska salt mine no you would love it okay Convince so me. vialitska is just outside krakow uh the mine goes a thousand feet deep The chambers and corridors of the mine, Tom, extend for 178 miles. (laughs) Okay. That is a wonder. (laughs) That really is a wonder. Yeah. God. So they discovered salt. They started in the sort of 11th, well, before that, actually, even in the Neolithic times, they'd found salt and they were sort of getting salt from springs, boiling it and so on. In the 11th and 12th centuries, they were digging wells. In the 13th century, they started to find lumps of rock salt, and then it occurred to them that they could start mining. Uh, King Casimir the Great, he really encouraged this, um, so that in the mid-14th century, about a third of the Polish royal treasury's income was coming from this salt this salt mine, unbelievably. Uh, at the end of the Middle Ages, they had four mining shafts, they're producing about 8,000 tons of salt. God, I've, um, I've just looked year. it up. They've got a chapel. Yes. The first, so. God, it looks amazing. It looks like, it looks like something from the Rings of Power. It is. It's bloody Casa Doom. So, yes, it is. Yes, the Mines of Moria. So tourists start going in the early modern period. Do you know, Tom, the name of the first tourist to visit the Vilitska salt mine? Uh, Dominic Schlangbrook. <laughs> No, it was Nicholas Copernicus. <laughs> was it? Wow. Yeah. The threads you were weaving into a beautiful tapestry. He visited in 1493, and there's a massive figure of Copernicus set up inside the salt mine. Oh. And you could admire it when you go. So it's so large that people start creating maps of it. Um, so there are, there are beautifully illustrated maps of it from the early 17th century. By the mid-17th century, the salt mine is on three different levels. Tourists are going every year. It's mentioned by European travelers. They have to get personal permission from the king. As I said, the Krakow area is taken over by the Austrians. The Austrians are very keen on this. They build a railway line underneath through these sort of tunnels of salt. And is that railway line, is, is it still going? I believe it's still there. Horse-drawn railway. But they, the, the Austrians are very keen on attracting tourists. They think this will... And, and they were right, because... They, pr- they, pr- they arrange all kinds of things. So you go in from 1868 onwards, you can go on a horse-drawn railway through the mine. Uh, you can do what they call the devil's drop, which is the miner's descent into the mine on a rope, sort of bungee jump <laughs> into mm-hmm. the mine. You can go on boat rides inside the mine wow. on a lake of salt. Wow. A lake um, of and salt. And there's also... There's a there's a miners orchestra that will play for you while you're touring the mine, and they'll also do fireworks. Unbelievably, God, I'm not sure I'd want. I'm not mm. well, I'm sure it's safe, but yeah, there's always well, a first time, isn't there? So it became incredibly, incredibly popular, and under independent Poland at the end of the First World War, it becomes a real symbol of national identity. Um, so more than hundred thousand people would visit every year. 
They would organize all kinds of conventions, political rallies, things like that inside the mine. It slightly declined under communism. They're no longer really producing salt production kind of reaches a peak in the 1970s and then declines. But tourism becomes more and more important. Basically, salt production ended in 1996 and it's now, you know, purely all about um, tourism. So the statue of Copernicus, made of salt, of course. And this was made when? So the statue of Copernicus was made in the 20th century. It was the 500th anniversary of his birth. What a, what a wonderful tribute. Yeah, it's a great point of pride to the miners to make statues of people they approve of. The most famous statue there is the statue of St. Kinga. I know you're like a saint, Tom, but <laughs> are you familiar with the story of St. Kinga? No. So she was a Hungarian princess. And she, she had an arranged marriage with the Prince of Krakow, who was called Boaswaf the Chaste. <laughs> uh, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of bridegroom that you want, isn't it? Yeah. That bodes well. It's that Henry VIII. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So she, as a dowry, she asks her father, the King of Hungary, I mean, this is a slightly implausible story, for a lump of salt. He gives her this lump of salt. And she does a very strange thing. Before she leaves Hungary, she throws her engagement ring from the Polish prince into the shaft of the salt mine that she got this lump of salt from. Then she goes off to, to Poland, to Krakow, and she says to the miners when she arrives, dig a huge pit until you come to a rock. Mm -hmm. they, they dig this pit. And they find the ring. They, they come to the rock. They find a massive lump of salt, presumably the same lump of salt that she had been given as the dowry. They split it in two. Do you know what they find inside? The ring. The ring. That's magic. Uh, so from that day on, she became the patron saint of salt miners uh, in Krakow. I mean, I don't think that's really saintly behavior. Well, Just it's miraculous. Rings it's miraculous, it's, uh, isn't it? Yeah. So her, they, the miners built her a chapel made of salt inside the salt mine at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so it's 100 meters beneath the earth. The floor is made of salt. There are murals of biblical scenes all made of salt. Oh, really, there are chandeliers, really all of this stuff. Now, the thing is, this is how I want to end this podcast. You can book that chapel now, Tom, uh, for 400 people and have meetings of your own there. And I think this would be the most brilliant location for a meeting of the, of the of members of the Rest is History Club. Yeah, it would, yes. wouldn't it? So, <laughs> yes, it really would. But I think what it depends on, I want to see... I will not arrange that meeting, and I don't want Goalhanger Productions to arrange that meeting unless they see a rush of new applications to join the Rest is History Club on the back of this podcast. So this is an incent a real incentive for our listeners. If you want to have your meeting in the bowels of an incredibly safe salt mine <laughs> where they've had <laughs> fireworks, fireworks display. <laughs> yeah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Before Tom Holland takes you on a canal trip at 45 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dominic, I, that was brilliant. Um, I didn't really know anything about any of those. And I absolutely want to go and see them all. So Great. Well, I think, I think Poland, here I come. I think we should do rest is history. We should do location report. We should. We? We should yes, we should. That'd be great. Kind of like Michael Palin. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you all for listening. I won't say goodbye in Polish because my Polish, frankly, is non-existent. But you'll just have to imagine it for yourselves. And on that bombshell, goodbye. Bye-bye.